little bit different for us now that we are officially streaming on the internet. Uh, it is different for us in our congregation. We often take the opportunity to interact with our sermons. We don't get that opportunity as much to do this. So please, for those gathered here in the congregation, we are welcome to discuss uh, many of the things after the service is done. Uh, so again, because remember, a lot of the folks streaming online will not be able to hear your comments. And so we're going to try to keep those things to a minimum. Unless there's absolutely something that you just do not understand, we'll try to get those things clarified. Uh, because again, for those who are watching for the first time, my purpose is to try to educate and also pull out some things in scriptures you might not know. My purpose is not to be here to tell you what to do and what to believe. And so I'm just here to be a guide and an assistance. You are welcome to disagree with me, and you're welcome to challenge me. But we encourage those types of discussions here. So we look at the gospel today from Mark chapter 3, verses 20 to 35. And this lesson is really at the very beginning of Jesus' ministry. And Jesus had started his ministry with a great big healing experience and throwing out and casting out demons. And he was now sitting in somebody's home, and he was sitting down with hundreds of people gathered there. And they were discussing many of the teachings of Jesus. And so while he was there, we were told that Jesus' family came along and thought he was absolutely out of his mind mad. It literally means out of his wits. He's nuts. That's what people are saying about him. And so Jesus' family came to rescue him. In fact, the Bible says his brothers tried to seize him and take him away from this experience. Now, why would his brothers want to take him away? Well, and, and I know you just said, wait a minute, some of you grew up with the tradition that Jesus didn't have any brothers, right? Well, you're welcome to read the box. There's a big box for those who have the sermon handouts that talks about Jesus and brothers. And it's very clear from the scriptures and from the physical evidence that we have that Jesus most certainly had biological brothers, and this is what's going to shock people, to marry and I know there are a lot of folks that are running for cover right now. You just did not say that. Mary was perpetually a virgin. And I'm not sure what planet you live on because the only evidence of that is a book that was written in 140 A.D. that some people now take as gospel. It claims to have been written by James, the brother of Jesus. Well, James, the brother of Jesus, or stepbrother in this case, was dead by that time. So we know it's a complete fabrication. And yet, the whole belief system that we have that Mary was a perpetual virgin is based on that one book that we know isn't even a true book. So with that in mind, so we also know that there's plenty of evidence in Scripture that indicates that while she was yet a virgin, in other words, there was a time that she was no longer a virgin, she gave birth to Jesus. And then, of course, these phrases about his brothers, in particular James. So we know that Jesus had a family. We know he had a biological family. We know he had had brothers and sisters to his mother Mary and to Joseph. And this was not a big offense to the early Christians and nobody worried about it. And that certainly doesn't take Mary's centrality away. Were you going to ask one thing? What, eight brothers and sisters. Well, we don't know how many brothers. Now that we don't know. Now that would be a, that would be a tradition. That would be a tradition uh, as far as the number. We just We only know, we only have listed one brother by name and that was James. So everything else would be traditions. So looking at this, why does Jesus' family think he's crazy? Why are they taking it away? Well, look at, again, the box in your handout for today. Because he was becoming quite a popular figure. And he was gaining followers. And that's just not something good Jewish boys do. Especially in that day and age. It was a dangerous time. A little bit about the politics of those times. Remember, the Romans had Israel under their thumb especially since Herod the Great died in 4 BC, right at the time of the birth of Jesus. Again, that might be a bombshell for people to believe that Jesus was born in uh, AD time. He was actually born for about 4 BC, because Herod the Great died about 4 BC. So we know he was born somewhere between 4 and 6. But during the time of Herod the Great, there was a big rebellion, and... Uh, the, the Romans didn't care for Herod the Great too much. They thought he had too much power. So the Romans came down hard on them, him after that country, after he died, and they separated the country into three parts called tetrarchies. And uh, the one uh, ruled by Herod and his other son Herod and his other son Herod. 
Okay. Is that that's true. Robot? That's true. <laughs> Actually, Herod was Herod's name, but they all wanted to be known as sons of Herod to legitimize themselves if ever came the time that they could take over the nation of Israel. At any rate, so it was a dangerous time to be a Jewish boy in those days and age, so they should not draw attention to themselves. And so his family wanted to save him from destructive path, because they knew the dangers of him being set up as a Messiah. Just what we need, Jesus, people calling you Messiah. Because you know what happens to people who call themselves Messiah? Oh, they all die, right? There are at least two claimants to the throne of Messiah during the time of Jesus. One was a guy by the name of Simon Perea. He was a slave to Herod the Great, who rebelled against Herod the Great, ultimately was captured, beheaded, so the end for him was not very good, was it? Look at the next guy, Anthrogenes. Anthrogenes was a shepherd who also rebelled. Now this was after Herod the Great. This was under his one son, Herod Archelaus, and so that was under a part of the nation of Israel. And after a two-year rebellion, uh, uh, Anthrogenes' army was destroyed and his four brothers were killed. And ultimately, he was arrested. Whatever happened to him in the end, we don't know. We assume that he was either killed or was either displayed and took on a public display all throughout the nation of Israel to avoid or to discourage people from doing these types of things. So that lesson was probably well heard by Joseph and Mary and Jesus and the family, and they certainly did not want him going off the deep end and claiming to be Messiah, because that had always a bad end. So we go on to verse 22. Now we're told that the religious leaders then came down to see Jesus, and they wanted to stop him and shut him up as well. You know, since Mary didn't work, and since his family didn't work, the religious leaders wanted him discredited. And so, because after all, the greatest opposition to change always comes from those who are in power. You know that's true whether you've been part of a moose club, or some type of a music group, or whether you're... Uh, in a sports uh, organization of some sort, it do, or government, it doesn't matter, the organization or institution, whenever new people come in, they are a threat to the people who've been there. Okay? And so the religious leaders, the people in charge, have the most to lose by the changes that Jesus wants to bring to their faith. Now I'm going to tell a story that I've not Told. I'm a little bit fretting for the fact that this is actually going live and might be heard by some of the people who are in position to have done this to us, but that's okay because they did this to us. I'm going to tell you a story of what happened in our Greensburg site about three, three years ago, three, four years ago. We had our site in Greensburg, uh, PA, that actually was doing quite well. We were reaching anywhere from 150 to 200 teenagers. We had a total of 350 teenagers on our Facebook page from Greensburg that were regularly interacting with us, and we built that up in a very short time, period of time. It was a very exciting time for like, what, three or four months. That was it. But I'm going to tell you what happened. Now the question becomes, why don't we have a site in Greensburg anymore? Well, because there were two attempts by the religious leadership in Greensburg, PA, to shut us down. Twice. Once, the pastors of our own denomination, by the way, decided that they didn't like the fact that we were the new kids on the block coming into their community and stealing their kids away, which, by the way, for those who knew what we were trying to do, we were not taking any kids from any congregation. We were only reaching kids who did not have any church background at all and had no proclivity to attend a church. We very clearly made that abundantly clear to them. We were only there for the unchurched people, but we represented a threat because we were taking kids who potentially could come to their congregation. Of course, not doing what they were doing, but that was their thought process. So the very first thing they did is they called the bishop of this synod. They complained to him, and then they called the bishop, the presiding bishop of our denomination. There was a big powwow at the southwestern Pennsylvania offices to which I was called. The presiding bishop was there. The bishop of this synod was there, my bishop was there, and 35 other pastors. You probably don't know this part of the story. And they confronted me and basically told me, you will cease and desist and you will not do this. Because it is a threat to what we're doing. You should let us do it and own it. 
That's what these other congregations wanted us to do. Fortunately, we have a very good bishop who stood up and said, well, you know what? If you're going to cast him out, you're going to have to cast me out in our entire synod too. And that's the only thing that stopped that opposition, at least from a direct perspective. But that wasn't the end of the story. See, they found another way to get to us from a political standpoint. Many of the members of their churches were involved in the politics of Greensburg, and so they put a lot of pressure on the mayor of the city of Greensburg, and so they decided that they would basically make it illegal for us to worship in this community. They came up to us and said, hey, they came up to us one day after a big event that they had going on, they came up to us and said, you have to shut this all down. We're like, why? This was the fire chief, or the assistant fire chief, by the way. The, the fire chief had, didn't have the courage to come out, neither did the police chief or any people that were involved. I don't know if the police chief was. I don't want to malign him because I don't know. I don't believe that he was involved. I think it was just the politicians putting pressure on the officials of the community, telling them they had to do this. And so actually it was, uh, it was a, um, the assistant uh, fire chief who came in and said, you are not, we are no longer allowed to let you worship here because you don't meet the highest standard that Pennsylvania has for occupancy. And if you're going to have kids here, you have to uh, meet those standards. And so we were never told that when you moved in here. We told you exactly what we we're going to do. Well, sorry. Well, the, nobody in the city of Greensburg meets the highest standards of occupancy. It would cost us $150,000 to have rehab that site. And it was well beyond our ability to do that. And they outright told me, by the way, any building you go into the city of Greensburg, we will follow you and make sure that you meet those occupancy standards. Basically, they were telling us that there was no place for us to go. They made it impossible for us to uh, continue our outreach. So that's what happened at that site. Why is that? Because religious leaders are threatened by change or by anybody who is intruding upon their turf. Okay? Change is always hard for those with power. And I say this about me, because I'm a person in power too, right? Change is hard for all of us, because we're often asked to change the things about which we consider ourselves an authority. And we don't like people to reign on our parade. So this is what the religious leaders are thinking while they come to Jesus. They want to discredit him and shut him down. But the interesting thing is their method of trying to discredit Jesus is absolutely absurd. What do they do? They claim, Jesus, you're just from Satan. You're casting out demons in the name of Beelzebul, in the name of Satan. We'll go on to the next page, verses 23 to 26. That is absolutely silly. And Jesus decided to confront them by telling two parables. But one of the things you need to understand about this response of Jesus in verses 23 to 26 is, in this lesson at least, we often think of Jesus just coming to loggerheads with the scribes and the Pharisees on a regular basis, right? We often think of them as antagonists. At this point in our lesson, Jesus is not yet an antagonist with the scribes and the Pharisees. In fact, his lesson and his parables come across with a great deal of surprising restraint it is patient and it is kind. It is only later that Jesus starts responding very harshly with the scribes and the Pharisees. In one sense, he's trying to win them over. He's giving them an opportunity before they dig a hole too deep for themselves. So again, Jesus does not initially attack the uh, Pharisees, but what he does is he uses these parables to illustrate the absurdity of their claim that his healing must come from Satan himself. Ultimately, what Jesus says is Satan is not he in the healing business, is he? Satan is in the destruction business. If there's healing going on, that's not from God, because God is in the healing business. Satan is in the destroying business, and Satan ultimately would not oppose himself. For were it true, if Satan were casting out Satan, that would be tantamount to Satan committing suicide. Okay? That would be inconsistent with the nature of and the character of Satan himself, right? We wish he would commit suicide too, I heard one say. Absolutely right, we do. But Satan isn't going to do that because Satan honestly wants to survive. And Satan is not going to destroy himself. It goes on, Jesus says in verse 27, that the expelling of demons requires a power that is greater than what Satan possesses himself. 
Now, I want you to connect the dots here. Who has power greater than Satan? Anybody here? Raise your hand. Me. Me. You do. Well, through the gift of the Holy Spirit, but it's not your power that's greater. It is the power of the Spirit of God that indwells in us that right. makes us more powerful than Satan himself. So Satan can do nothing to us. But ultimately, what, what this is before the giving of the Holy Spirit to everybody. So I want you to connect the dots. You've got to remember that these folks are thinking they don't have the Holy Spirit. No human has the power to cast out Satan. So who's the only one that has power to cast out Satan? Let's put our thinking gaps on. Oh, it must be God. So who is Jesus? Jesus is God. Okay? That's the implication of this lesson. We miss that in some of those neat little wrinkles that are written into the text because we just hear it from our Christian perspective. You've got to hear it from the Jewish perspective. That's what they're hearing. There's a claim being made here that if Jesus has the power to bind the strong man, he must be God. And here's the cool thing. That means that Satan's reign is over because Jesus marks the very beginning of God's reign. The strong man is bound. There is no return from Satan for Satan because God is the one who's in control because what Jesus is doing. So there's something really profound being stated here about who Jesus is. Go on to verse 30, 28 to 30. Ultimately, Jesus ends with a warning for the Pharisees. Now, here's the interesting thing. Jesus takes them aside and tells them these parables, and then he wants to tell them, I'm just, I'm just letting you know, you're going down the wrong path if you do this. You're going down a dangerous path that could lead to a thing called the blasphemy of the Spirit, which is the only unforgivable sin. So people can murder people. You can be a prostitute. Okay? You can be an atheist. You can be an agnostic. You can be in another religion. You can uh, swear and cuss and say all sorts of nasty things. You can drink and take drugs. All of those things are not unforgivable things for God. Because God wants a relationship with everybody. But there's only one thing that's unforgivable, and that's ultimately the blasphemy of the Holy Spirit. Now, what is the blasphemy of the Holy Spirit? I don't know if you're aware of this. There's actually a website called, you ready? The Blasphemy Project. Have you heard of that? The Blasphemy Project is a website created by atheists to say as the most vile, uh, defamatory types of things they can about God and about the Holy Spirit in hopes that they can earn that eternal damnation from God. Okay? That is true. However, I will tell you, and this is what I tell my atheist friends who are on that site, and I've put a, a plug on that. I said, you, by what you've said, will never be damned to hell because of that. You know why? Because that's not blasphemy of the Holy Spirit. You have to have a relationship with God in order to blaspheme the Holy Spirit. If you don't have a relationship with God, you cannot blaspheme the Holy Spirit. And there's something else required to blaspheme the Holy Spirit. Not only must you have a relationship with God, you must be in a position of power to oppress other people who have a relationship with God. So what is blaspheming of the Holy Spirit? It means me as a person who has the power to, uh, to tell people about God or to hold people, uh, or hold, hold people away from God. I hold people away from God or I, I lead people astray intentionally in order, to, um, in order to gain power and position around myself. So let me, let me say it another way. I can read it. I, I have it written better than what I just said. Religious leaders who use their position to surround themselves with power and refuse to submit to the will of God are the ones open to committing this sin. So of those sitting here today, just about the only person capable of committing blasphemy of the Holy Spirit is me. That's it. Now, some of you could put yourselves in that type of position, but none of you are. I'm the one that has a turf that I want to protect, right? And if I protect my turf, and when my protection of that turf goes against the will of God, and I do it defiantly, I am at risk of committing the blasphemy of the Holy Spirit. You see how that works? That's what blasphemy of the Spirit is. When those with power refuse to submit to the will of God, even though they know better, 
and they do it in defiance, and they do it in their own self-interest. That is the blasphemy of the Spirit. So Jesus, so if you're worried about committing the blasphemy of the Holy Spirit, don't worry. And if you're worried about it, you haven't. Nobody who's worried about it ever commits the blasphemy of the Holy Spirit. So you have no fret, no worries. Let's go on to verse 32. We're then finished with this part of the story. Once again, Jesus' mother, remember, there's hundreds of people around Jesus that have listened to him. And Jesus' mother can't even get into the point where she can be seen by Jesus. And so she had, and by the way, his brothers and sisters, did you notice that it mentions his brothers and sisters are coming to take him away because he's gone nuts. He's gone off the deep end. And so Jesus' mother wants to get him away from these crowds. And here's the thing you've got to understand. This is a good Jewish mother, Mary is. And when a good Jewish mother says for you to do something, it doesn't matter whether you're 50 years of age, you do it. Okay? Because every Jewish boy is a mama's boy and is supposed to be a mama's boy. Now, I know a lot of our other nationalities share those common characteristics. Whether you're Italian, sometimes they do that too. A lot of our other nationalities. But you better believe it was expected. When your mom told you to do something, you did it. And so she's saying, son, and so the crowd, it says in there that the message gets passed up to Jesus. Hey, your mom is back there. She told you to shut up and go home. Okay? Now, any good Jewish boy would say, okay. Oh, but not Jesus. You want to know why Jesus doesn't do it? Because the mother's claim, again, has precedence over every claim, every other claim over the child. But Jesus should have listened to her. But Jesus is a revolutionary. Jesus' message takes precedence over even the will of his mother. And so here's the thing about his mom. His mom had to at some point deal with that. To realize that she was no longer primary in Jesus' life. That the message and the ministry that Jesus was embarking upon, even if it led to his death, was more important than her claim on his life and her desire that he live. Wow, that's a tough thing for a mom to do. Yeah. I'm going to tell you a story, and I haven't shared a lot of this in years. But those who know me know that um, when I grew up, you know, my dad was killed when I was seven years of age. My mom remarried when I was 11. My stepfather was a tyrant. He beat me, and I've been thrown through plate glass windows. I've been beaten unconscious. It was a very abusive situation. We were forced, my, three, my two brothers and I, to change our names. So you may not, most of you probably don't know this, I've not always been David Jones. For quite a number of years, my name was David Reether because that was my stepfather's name. And, uh, and then when I got to college, I finally got away from the grip of all of this, and I had a friend of mine, Rob Coy, who said to me, why, do you, why did you change your name? Oh, well, in my household, you change your name or else you die. That was just the way it is. He said, well, I would have never changed my name. So it got me thinking, it got me on a path that ultimately led us, uh, my wife was very gracious about this, she agreed to this, because she had to change her name a second time too we decided to go change my name back to David Jones. And I'm so grateful that we did. But I will tell you, it caused a great strain between my mom and my stepfather. My mom called me up after she found the news about this and she said, how dare you do this? Don't you know how badly this hurts your stepfather or your father? How dare you do this to him? And I said to her, mom, I didn't do this to him. I did this for me. And if he chooses to take offense, that's his problem. Okay? Am I right? So I guess Mary is kind of in this situation. Is she going to choose to take offense at what Jesus does? And how he basically blows her off. He says, well, you know what? My message and what my ministry is is more important than my mom's claim over my life. Mary could have changed or could have been offended by this, but she chose not to be offended. We know that how? because we are told that she becomes one of the disciples and followers of Jesus. Therefore, her relationship with Jesus is no better than anybody else's. And Jesus ultimately says that. He says that everybody who comes to me in relationship with me has the type of relationship that I have with my mother and my brothers and my sisters. 
So what do we learn from this? Again, I think what we learned is that a relationship with God is a spiritual one, not one based upon our biology or our birth. And so all of us have the opportunity and privilege to have an intimate, brotherly, sisterly, motherly relationship with the Almighty God. I think that's amazing. I didn't think that, that's incredible. Yes, it means that you'll be making chicken noodle soup for Jesus on the days where he's sick, I guess. I don't know what that means. I always said, you're being mother. But whatever it means, you are called to be mother, brother, sister of Jesus. And what a privilege that is, not because of your biology, but because of your new birth in Jesus Christ. The other great thing about this is that Jesus then opens up the kingdom of heaven even to those who are not Jews. I'm not a Jew, but I have the privilege of having a relationship with God is what Jesus Christ has done. And then lastly, we are called to live our theology, not just study it and know it. So the Pharisees and the scribes, they knew their theology, but Jesus is basically challenging them, then you've got to live it. You know what the theology is. Live the theology that you have studied and learned. Why is this important? Let me use a good illustration to end today. I will tell you, um, be very specific with this. Um, we all have listened uh, to this Bruce Jenner, Caitlyn Jenner thing going on. And I will confess, I, I really don't care. I'm not, I'm not here to criticize or anything. Bruce Jenner is a, is a hero of mine. And I have no problems with his choices. It's people that are blowing it, this all up and so forth. And that's fine. It's their choice. What bothers me, though, is, you know, and I know there are a lot of things that bother you about this, but I'm talking in particular what bothers me is some of the responses of some of the people about this. In particular, some of my brothers and sisters in Christ. I have seen on some of my brothers and sisters in Christ Facebook pages some horrendous things about him. And just uh, her, I, get, I, I apologize because he preferred to be called a her, Caitlin, right now. And I'm fine with that. That's his choice. But there's some horrendous things about how he's a freak and how he's going to hell and how he's a sinner and how he's uh, on and on and on. Just all these things, salacious types of things about this, this person. And I, and I actually told one of them, I said, how is that living your theology? They're like, what? I said, aren't we supposed to be people who are known by our love? Yeah, and so you preach a theology of love, and then you go slam this guy, and then you go say all types of salacious types of things about Caitlyn Jenner, and then you call this person all these sorts of horrendous names, and that somehow is supposed to represent the love of Christ? Okay? You need to live your theology. If we are to be about love, how you respond to Caitlyn Jenner is determinative of how you are living your theology. Are you living it in love, or are you casting stones? So that's what I think Jesus is ultimately calling the scribes and the Pharisees, to live your theology. Don't just know your theology. I'm going to invite us to uh, bow our heads in prayer here today. Is this a lot? I, I know there's not like a consistent, nice, big bang end.